Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Americans for Peace Now webinar with Palestinian political scientist Khalil Shikaki. I'm Ori Nir with APN. Uh, before we start, our usual comments. Uh, the webinar is recorded. The video recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, the audio will be posted uh, on our podcast, PeaceCast. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions uh, throughout the webinar. You actually can start doing that right now. Um, and the way you do it is using the Q&A tool that's at the bottom of your screen, not the raise hand tool, but the Q&A tool. Um, and I would ask if you can to keep your questions short because we, we go through them throughout the webinar and it's kind of difficult to read uh, long comments and so on. Um, in the past few months, we, we've been focused on the political crisis in Israel. Uh, but, you know, Israel's Palestinian neighbors are experiencing an ongoing crisis of their own, partly because of their relationship with Israel and partly irrespective of that. Uh, the crisis there is political, diplomatic, economic, social, uh, really multifaceted and is clearly manifested in public opinions and attitudes. Uh, Dr. Khalil Shakaki uh, is the leading Palestinian pollster. Uh, he is um, he own, he has a think tank in uh, Ramallah, Ramallah based. It's called uh, the Palestinian Center for Policy for Policy, the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research, uh, PCPSR. Um, it takes the pulse of the Palestinian public in the West Bank and Gaza uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the results of its recent polls show how deep the level of mistrust uh, uh, and disappointment and frustration and hopelessness is uh, among Palestinians, and it's really um, quite stunning when you when you look at the the results. Uh, Khalil is a long long time guest, long time friend of APN, long time guest on our webinars and podcasts. He hosts us uh, uh, in person annually when we visit his office in Ramallah, which uh, we just did recently. Uh, in the past, when when we spoke with him uh, publicly on on such uh, occasions as webinars and so on, we we asked him to accentuate the positive. Uh, in our conversation today, I guess we'll explore whether there's any positive to accentuate. Uh, things are pretty grim. Uh, Khalil, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ori. Good to be with you. Um, Khalil, let, let's start with a, a broad question. Um, how would you characterize the Palestinian reaction to the new Israeli government? And let's talk both about the reaction among the Palestinian leadership, uh, policies, positioning, etc. You can you can refer both to the leadership in the West Bank uh, and Hamas in, in Gaza, uh, but also public reactions, public attitudes? Well, uh, actually, this is a very good question to, to begin with, because it helps us to set the frame for, for the discussion about Palestinian politics. Uh, so let me sort of give a, a background to, to how Palestinians viewed various Israeli governments. Um, in the past, uh, the, the PA faced two types of Israeli governments, you have the left wing and, and right wing, sometimes with the center joining one or the other. For both types, the settlement issue has been the Achilles heel of the peace process. This was destructive to the ability of the PA to build support for the idea that there is a partner for peace in Israel. Nonetheless, the PA measured or assessed its relations with these two types of governments, the left and the right, based on two things. One, the extent to which uh, the, there was room for progress towards ending the occupation. Um, and the second was the extent to which the Israeli government they were dealing with was perceived or viewed uh, as one that favored a strong PA. And so it so a strong PA as an essential Israeli need. The left and the center were welcome because, oh, the, the, despite the settlement concerns, because progress was feasible in the peace process, even if no agreements were, were reached. Uh, 
And because a strong PA was seen uh, as a partner, or at least this is how the PA perceived uh, the, the manner in which the Israeli government viewed it. This has been the case for Rabin and, and, and for Barak and, and uh, for all governments. On the other hand, right-wing governments were not welcomed because of the belief that they were not committed to the two-state solution and then because the PA perceived that their interests, the interests of the, of the right wing, lied in a weak, not a strong PA. Naturally, this led occasionally to greater friction and sometimes even violence. Nonetheless, with these two types of governments, left and right, the conflict was mostly about border, land, that is, and security. What the PA found early this year is that it is now facing a new type of government, one uh, with which it did not have to deal in the past, one in which the conflict, in fact, goes back to its original roots as an existential conflict, not only over land and, and security, but also over identity, uh, holy places, us versus them, and with a religious dimension uh, as an added bonus, uh, without a possible meeting ground. A new Israel is emerging in the eyes of the PA, and Hamas shares with that sentiment, Hamas leadership. This new Israel is characterized by its national religious identity compared to the national secular Israel of the past. The PA came to the conclusion that its, its own mere existence, even as a weak PA, was no longer guaranteed, was no longer the expressed interest of this new Israel. Since its creation, the PA has never confronted this sort of twofold or double threat, <clears throat> one that ends the prospect for peace, uh, but more significantly, as some Palestinians would say, one that poses a threat to the mere existence of the PA. Um, so there should be no doubt that the PA will not under these conditions be able to maintain the kind of cooperation or even the kind of security control it has been able to maintain in the past. The capacity and the motivation of the PA to do so are currently suffering as a result of the formation of the new national religious government in Israel. We have already seen this, this capacity, security capacity eroding in some of the areas where the Palestinian national sentiment as opposed to the religious sentiments um, was high or, or higher than the religious sentiment as the case has been in the Northern part of the West Bank. This has been traditionally Farah land, secular and nationalist. What contributed to this development has been uh, the, uh, uh, an additional driver that, that is homemade, that, that is separate from Israel and its policies. It's in the domestic setting. But turning back now to, to, the, to, to your but question you, about the popular what, what level. Think, what, what do you mean by that, something, a, a, a cause that is homemade? Well, that is the, the development in the domestic political scene. The, the the PA losing legitimacy, losing credibility in the eyes of the Palestinian public, seen as weak, uh, as authoritarian, corrupt, without electoral legitimacy. This is a domestic development that has its roots in the developments since the, the last elections in 2006 uh, and the split between the West Bank and Gaza. This has created significant levels of uh, discontent, particularly among young Palestinians. This discontent is not being expressed in direct violence against the PA, uh, but rather in challenging the PA's monopoly over coercive force. And the fact that these groups 
are the, the foot soldiers, the rank and file, are secular and nationalists rather than Islamists. They're not Hamas or Islamic Jihad, although Hamas and Islamic Jihad do strongly support them and, and with all kinds of assistance, whether financial or arms or training. Nonetheless, the foot soldiers are secular and nationalist with links to Farah and the PA. And so the PA finds it very difficult to go after them for field civil war. It's not like going after a Hamas infrastructure. And this has been the additional driver that has led uh, to, the, to, to the willingness of a large number of young Palestinians to challenge the PA's monopoly over course of force and to create these armed groups. Um, but I was going to turn to the popular level. You asked how the, both the PA, the leadership, uh, and that of Hamas, and, and, and the public at large, there is a difference between uh, the, the two. The difference uh, uh, between the, the new Israel and the old Israel is not really as significant as it is for the PA. It's not as significant for the Palestinian public. For the public, the right-wing governments in Israel were as bad as the current national religious government as the criteria here is, is focused, I mean, I mean, um, among the Palestinian public, is focused almost entirely on the prospects for ending the occupation. However, even with the public, the new Israel is an added threat, one that is focused on holy places, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and to a lesser extent on the perception that the speed of creeping annexation will now be much faster and the cruelty of occupation uh, will be now greater. Got it. Um, I I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the Palestinian Authority and its weaknesses. It really is suffering from almost every kind of crisis imagined, from economic to governability to uh, the succession issue, uh, public confidence and security, and so on and so forth. How stable is the PA? Uh, how how does it continue to survive and function? And what are its uh, sustainability prospects in a post Abbas era? Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is is old and um, um, you know getting older. Uh, is there a way of resurrecting it as a credible administrator uh, uh, at all in in, in the future? Uh, well, you you wanted some optimism, uh, <laughs> seeing the cup half full rather than half empty. <laughs> Actually, in in this question, I I can be uh, as optimistic as you want in answering your last part of you asked several questions here. So let me let me begin by answering them one after the other. The PA is highly resilient because the elite in control will fight for it as it fights for its own survival. The public is not as committed to it, but there is nonetheless significant fears, even among the public, that life without it, particularly in, in with regard to service delivery in certain areas like health, education, social security, and perhaps even to some extent law enforcement, uh, these are things that the public uh, will miss very much if the PA collapses or uh, is dissolved. Nonetheless, given the significant erosion in governance, legitimacy, and trust in the PA that I mentioned earlier, the perception that, uh, or, or the motivation uh, on the part of the Palestinian public to challenge uh, the authority is, is very high. Israeli incursions, of course, uh, provide the justification for young men to arm and organize and challenge the PA's monopoly over course of force, as I indicated earlier. The threat so far, however, is manageable because these groups target Israelis for now, mostly settlers and an army, but, but rather than the PA. So nonetheless, let me say that the, the, 
the threat these groups pose is difficult for the PA to deal with, contain or eliminate. And I've mentioned uh, some of the, of the reasons for that. Um, one which I mentioned was the, the fact that they are mostly national, the foot soldiers are mostly nationalists uh, and, and many of them are Farah based. But the second is that the public, uh, is that the, the, the PA does not really have uh, almost any support among the public to act against these groups. The public so far has been overwhelmingly in favor of the formation of the groups with, with no legitimacy or trust. Therefore, the PA does not want to risk a confrontation with uh, these groups for fear of, of civil war. But this logic leads to a vicious cycle. Uh, army incursions double and triple, in fact. Last year, the number of Israeli army incursions tripled in numbers. And uh, in order to do what the PA cannot do, the army wants to do that. This in turn weakens the PA or weakens the PA further and help to diminish its credibility, thereby increasing the popularity of the armed groups and increase the number of people wanting to join them, which in turn leads to an even greater number of incursions, army incursions, and so on. Right now, this is the most significant potential threat to the stability of the Palestinian Authority. Now, add to that two more things, and you have mentioned uh, one of them, uh, but I will start with the other one. The new uh, Israel, the new Israeli government seems determined to punish the PA for policies it doesn't like. And, and this takes a financial form of uh, financial constraints, um, withholding some of the funds, uh, the, 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 the clearance funds from the PA. The PA cannot pay salaries in full. This has been the case in the in recent past, but it is now even worse because of the additional cuts uh, or deductions that Israel, uh, the new Israel, uh, the new government has has made. The PA therefore becomes weaker and weaker. And the second is what you uh, asked about. Just, just, to, about just to mention here, Khalil, I'm sorry that I'm uh, barging, but if I understand correctly, there is a teacher's strike now, and I've seen mountains of uh, of refuse in Palestinian cities. Um, what, what's happening with that? The, the PA cannot pay salaries in full. And these teachers have been promised for two years that their salaries will be raised. And the PA has not been able to implement its commitments. So the, uh, the, uh, this is part, this is not the only reason, but this is part of the reason for that. Uh, these strikes have been, this particular strike, in fact, is now into its third month. And these are teachers who teach in public schools. And so they, uh, the kids are out without school. And so you would think families would be angry, yet more than two thirds of the public in the West Bank, in fact, more than 70% in our latest survey say they support the teachers in their strike against the PA. And that, you, to, to, now, the truth is the PA does not have the resources to pay any increase. And it is not even able to pay the, the, the previous rate at the previous rates. Yet, if we now ask the public, is this the reason why the PA is unable to uh, comply with the demands of the teachers? The overwhelming majority will say, no, the PA has all the resources it needs to pay them but the PA is lying, the PA is corrupt, the PA, and so on. So the lack of trust in the PA creates an environment that rewards any mutiny or, or any attempt, these the teachers are not attempting mutiny, but they are challenging the Palestinian Authority. And so any challenge will be rewarded by public support. This goes for the armed groups as, is, as it, uh, it goes for the teachers who are currently striking. But you wanted to add another uh, Yes, and that is what you asked about, which is Abbas, his age and, and his health. Now, in his absence, uh, assuming we're not able to do anything before that, 
uh, to resolve the problems that I'm about to talk, uh, I'm, I'm about to talk about. Um, in his absence, we're most likely to see anarchy and perhaps even some violence, intra-Palestinian violence, and perhaps even intra-Fareh violence. This violence could erupt, and if it does, the, the, the likelihood that it, it will, in my view, is greater than the likelihood that it will not. That will provide a context for a much greater breakdown of the PA's ability to enforce law or maintain security. The vacuum that exists today is relatively small. The vacuum in terms of the ability of the Palestinian Authority to enforce law and order and, and ensure a monopoly over coercive force and so on. This it is this vacuum that led to the emergence of these groups. But without Abbas, this vacuum could become much bigger, leading to a greater expansion of armed groups and the entry of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and, and possibly even Fareh into this business uh, of uh, arming and, and confronting the Israeli army and, and challenging whoever is trying to control the Palestinian Authority. So is there a way, your, your question, the one that I think uh, does have a good answer uh, if the PA wants one, which is an optimistic answer, uh, is that there is indeed a way to prevent that and ensure a stronger PA, one that is indeed capable of gaining control over security and in, in the future manage any succession uh, issues or, or, uh, or just manages the, the, the normal process of succession. The answer uh, is that indeed there is uh, one, uh, there is a prospect for that, uh, but it's not really, high. I mean, it's not great. Um, and that lies in holding elections and reunifying the West Bank and Gaza. Holding elections and reunifying the West Bank and Gaza will not lead to the return of Hamas to the control of the PA. There is almost zero chance that Hamas would win the next elections, uh, given the changes in the in our electoral system, the prospect of that happening is, is almost zero. But, uh, and of course, if that happens, the PA will indeed regain a huge amount of legitimacy and support right away. And, uh, but, but, but it will be a PA without Abbas. And, the, and we would avert the entire issue of succession. But let's assume that we only go for parliamentary elections and Abbas remains president and we do not hold presidential elections, which is of course feasible. This is the scenario that Abbas uh, was going to implement in, in, in 21 and, and before he decided to cancel all elections altogether. But if Abbas remains in this scenario that I'm now putting forward, uh, and, and we confront a, a legitimate a question of succession after him, the fact that we would have a parliament uh, provides all we need for a very smooth succession process, pretty much similar to what happened when Arafat died um, in 2004. That's how how much uh, optimism I can give you. <laughs> well, that's that's something given the the fact that we're about to dive into further uh, grimness. So I wanted to now shift a little bit to public opinion and ask you a few questions about that. Uh, I looked. I, I I really kind of uh, read very thoroughly um, the findings of of your latest poll, the March poll, uh, and the picture is grim. Uh, uh, let's try to break down and discuss uh, uh, the makeup of that bleak uh, picture. A vast majority of those polled in your March uh, 2023 poll, both in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, are unsatisfied with Mahmoud Abbas's performance. I think it was 77% combined. You also asked whether people think the PA is, is, is an accomplishment or a burden for the Palestinians. And... Again, I, I, I'm I was quite surprised that 63%, uh, a solid majority, said that it's a burden, whereas only 33% said, said it was an accomplishment. 
if if such a question were asked, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, the the uh, it would have probably been the other way around, or or even uh, anyway. Uh, a large majority uh, last month also said that they think uh, Abbas should resign. So my question to you, when we take all of these together, are what are the main reasons? You've you've mentioned some of them earlier, but are, are the reasons for the frustration with Abbas more a message of people's um, disappointment with his political path of negotiations with Israel and uh, peace process, or is it more about the inability of the PA to deliver as an administrator, as a government? Uh, you're right about uh, our findings. And in fact, uh, when we asked the question about the PA, the, the majority, the uh, slim majority, but a majority nonetheless, that we found uh, viewing the collapse or the dissolution of the Palestinian Authority as serving the national interest. In fact, we also had a majority, a large majority, that said the continued existence of the Palestinian Authority served the national interests of the State of Israel rather than the Palestinians. This is unprecedented because the last time, well, we've been asking about this for at least 12 years. And the first time when we asked about it, only a, a small minority of 15% uh, said uh, we should dissolve the PA or, or, or allow it to collapse. And we now have, I think, our survey showed 52% uh, who said uh, that it should um, it, it would be fine if it, it collapses, or that 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 indeed this would serve the national interest of the Palestinians. The reason for that is that the, the, the level of discontent with the PA has indeed been on the rise during the the entire the last decade in particular. There is a uh, 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 the, the, the trust in the PA has been diminishing, its legitimacy has been diminishing. Um, and this is particularly true among young Palestinians. What has been driving this are things, most importantly, even before we come to the collapsed uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process, is the greater authoritarianism, perceived greater authoritarianism in the political system. We, the, the PA is being seen by the overwhelming majority of the public as a one-man show. That is a very important driver of the discontent. The absence of elections is another driver. Abbas has been in office since 2005. Uh, it's now 13 years of him in, in the government without electoral legitimacy. So his term was for four years, and that the absence of elections, uh, since it is the man who is uh, who stands to lose the elections, who is responsible for the absence of elections, there is a significant public um, demand uh, for elections, but the belief that the PA will not be holding elections. That's what we found our most recent survey found the overwhelming majority wanting elections, but also thinking that it will not happen anytime soon. There's a third reason for the discontent, and that had to do with the weakened institutional design of the Palestinian Authority. The judiciary has been essentially left uh, totally lacking in independence. Uh, there is no legislature, so there is no accountability. There is no oversight in the entire political system. Um, uh, this is one reason why, if if there is a succession process right now under current conditions, uh, the, there is concern about what I mentioned earlier, the the anarchy and 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 the potential for intra-Palestinian violence. There is, there are two additional reasons that are beyond uh, the issues of governance and 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 so on, and that is the failed reunification of the West Bank and Gaza. The over time. When the split between the West Bank and Gaza took place in 2007, and for almost seven years after that, the public blamed Hamas. But since 2014, and particularly since 2017, we have seen uh, a, a clear majority among the public that blames Abbas 
with the failure of the of reunification between the West Bank and Gaza. Finally comes the issue of uh, the belief that Abbas is too soft on Israel. That is, he's, he's lacking in credibility. He makes all kinds of threats with no intention whatsoever of implementing any of those. And the latest of this, uh, the, the latest lack of credibility is the perception that the PA declare, has declared it, its ending security coordination, but the overwhelming majority does not believe that the PA has indeed uh, ended security coordination. And in fact, uh, evidence, there is greater evidence that this public perception is more accurate than the declared uh, uh, statement by the PA that it has ended security coordination with Israel. The lack of credibility is particularly evident in, take, uh, in defending Palestinians, take Hawara, and the, and the incident in Hawara when settlers attacked the town. Hawara is in area B. The main road is in area B. And the Palestinian Authority has the jurisdiction over law and order in these areas. It does not have security jurisdiction, but it does have law enforcement jurisdiction. Why, where were the Palestinian police then? The Palestinian public asked. Why uh, for four hours settlers were destroying the town, but not a single Palestinian policeman showed up. Uh, that is their responsibility. But, the, the, but Hawar, just one example, where the Palestinian public basically says, we pay uh, somewhere between a quarter to one third of our budget to our security sector, and it's unable to deliver security for us when we need it. Why do we need this security sector? And the public tends, because of this policy of the PA, refraining from confronting settlers uh, in areas where it is their jurisdiction to confront the settlers and protect the Palestinian uh, civilians. And the PA fails to do so. This creates this uh, deep gap between the Palestinian public and increases the level of discontent. Um, I want to ask you about uh, popular positions and attitudes regarding the two-state solution. Uh, we, we, there are quite a few questions in the Q&A, and by the way, people are welcome to add more. There's some good questions there, and I'll address them soon. Um, uh, I'm, I'm suspecting that one reason for those questions is that uh, there were several US scholars who published an article in the current issue of Foreign Affairs proposing, uh, advocating a, a radical shift in U.S. policy on Israel-Palestine from the two-state paradigm to a kind of a one-state uh, uh, policy um, where both Israelis and Palestinians would enjoy uh, uh, equal rights. Uh, now, most Palestinians seems, seem to reject this idea, to not support the idea of a one-state uh, solution, so-called, uh, they also don't seem to be supportive of a two-state solution, if I understand correctly the findings of your poll. So, yeah. what do they support? What, what, what's and and why don't why would wouldn't would it, would they not support those two uh, models? So let, let me put this in in context. Support for the two-state solution thirty years ago, when the peace process started, when Oslo was signed, was eighty to eighty-five percent. And support right now is just 27%. Now, the decline in support for the two-state solution has been gradual year after year. Um, but the last five years in particular have been the hardest. Now, we have seen over the years that the support for the, when, particularly when we started to see a decline in support for the two-state solution, that this decline was generated essentially by the perception that the two-state solution, because of settlement expansion, is no longer feasible, that it is no longer, uh, you, you are unable to separate the two peoples into two separate states. Now, this is uh, the perception of the public, whether this is true or not is a different question. But that is the prevailing perception. Now, we have seen that those who come to this conclusion that the two-state solution is no longer feasible, and those who have come to this conclusion, unfortunately today, are more than 70% of the Palestinian public. 
they basically abandoned support the minute they reached this conclusion, which uh, the, 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 this, the, percept the percentage of those who have come to this conclusion has been on the rise uh, since the day Netanyahu became prime minister in 2009. And in fact, this is when the original decline, we still had a majority at that time, but at that point, we started to see a speedy decline in support in support for the two-state solution, because uh, at that time, we started to see significant rise in the perception that the two-state solution is no longer feasible. So what happened to those who back then, uh, uh, around this time, uh, were abandoning the two-state solution? Where did they go? Well, they went to support uh, a one-state solution with equal rights. Most of them were young people who wanted uh, equal rights. And um, the idea of independence and sovereignty, while important, uh, was not as important as the demand for equal rights, particularly since they have come to the conclusion that sovereignty and independence is, is no longer feasible. So the least they could have, uh, in their view, was equal rights. So. Those who abandoned two states, the two-state solution went to supporting a, a one-state solution. However, in May 21, during the Hamas-Israel war, the violence in, in mixed cities changed all of this significantly. That is, I'm now referring to the support for the one-state solution. Support for the one-state solution, which stood at about a third at that time. A third is not the highest we've ever been. We've actually reached, uh, we had more than a third at one point, um, but, but a third was where we were back then, declined almost immediately after the May war, and it hasn't recovered since then. And so uh, even though I've said earlier, the support for the one two-state solution is now only 27 percent well support for the one-state solution is even less than that so this uh 27 uh, percent is still relatively more than the support for any other solution there is a third solution of course there are three visions in in palestinian society today for this actually there are four now i'll, I'll tell you what happened to the fourth one but the third one is hamas's vision which is uh, an Islamic and an Arab state uh, where Jews uh, can live here if they want to, but they should not expect equal rights. So, the, so it is a one-state solution, but without equal rights for Israeli Jews. That is, uh, this is the third, and the level of support right now is highest for the two-state solution, followed by a one-state solution with equal rights, and thirdly, for a one-state solution without equal rights. And however, fourthly, the group that you've asked, what do they support? Well, the group that is growing in size is the group that believes there is nothing to support because there is no political solution to the conflict, that the conflict uh, is essentially permanent and will never be resolved. This is the, the highest the highest of the frustration and the despair that we see among the Palestinian public. This group of Palestinians, uh, which now stands somewhere between 20 to 25%, um, has essentially lost all hopes. And we do find the greatest level of support for violence among this group, because this group do does not believe in, in diplomacy or negotiations anymore. Um, but they do not necessarily share Hamas's uh, values or support Hamas's vision. So I just wanted to sharpen something interesting that you said earlier, that um, there was a change following the, the May 2021 events. If I understand correctly, the, the change... So the, the question that you asked regarding the one-state solution has to do with a vision of a one-state where Jews and Arabs enjoy equal rights. If I understand correctly, what happened in, in, in May 2021 was that people saw that even in inside Israel, where Jews and Arabs, to some extent, to, to a large extent, enjoy equal rights, even then, uh, the conflict doesn't come to an end. The conflict yes. still is, the, there's, the embers are still burning. Is that is that the case? 
Absolutely, okay. indeed. That that essentially, the, the despite the fact that the, this is sort of an implementation of a, a one-state solution, with uh, you might not necessarily agree that there is equal rights. But still, this is the vision. In fact, when we, sometimes when we ask about a one-state solution, sometimes we say similar to uh, the, what we now see uh, in Israel uh, with Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, something like this. And, and we do find support for that. Uh, again, uh, not a majority, but, but a small percentage of those who support a one-state solution uh, with equal rights do support that kind of uh, solution. What they saw in May 21 was that uh, the conflict erupts at the first opportunity, uh, that there is violence, and, and that uh, this solution is not what they thought uh, it would be, that there would not be equal rights, and that violence will continue to haunt them, even uh, if they go that way. Now, it did not necessarily lead to an increase in, in demand for or support for a, a two-state solution. But the, 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 one should not confuse the support for the two-state solution with the demand of the Palestinians to have a state of their own uh, and to end the Israeli occupation. It is the belief that a two-state solution coming uh, as a result of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, that is being attacked right now. But the idea that the Palestinian that Israeli occupation can end, and the, and the Palestinians can then have the opportunity to create their own state, that is something that continues to be the top priority of the Palestinians in all of our surveys. There has almost never been a change since we've been asking about this that the top priority for the Palestinian public continues to be ending occupation and building a Palestinian state. But as I said earlier, this should not be confused with the two-state solution in which the creation of a Palestinian state is dependent on an agreement with Israel that uh, is now no longer feasible. Good. I'm looking at the clock and I'm looking at the number of questions and the and the kind of weight of questions we have. An, an interesting question uh, has to do with Jerusalem. There's someone here who's, who asked what's happening in Jerusalem. Uh, when you do your 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 polls, you you don't uh, question people in Jerusalem. Uh, you um, we do. You you do. Oh oh That's okay. Important. So uh, are they included in in the West Bank? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, you do, however, have a separate um, kind of comparison poll on your website now. I would encourage people yes. to look at it, and maybe Max can put a, a link to it. There's an essay there which compares a poll that was taken in 2010 to one that was taken last year. Um, and the results, I thought the results are fascinating. Uh, what to me they show, and I wanted to ask you if you agree, and if so, how do you, what do you make out of it? Is that there's actually a the the emergence of a separate identity of East Jerusalemite Palestinians that is somewhat separate from West Bank Palestinians. You now have you know Gaza Strip Palestinian identity, West Bank, and to some extent at least in a separate East Jerusalem one. Uh, how do you is is that correct? Do you do you agree with that? Well, the word identity is is uh, loaded. It's it's difficult for one to um, agree without knowing what, what it contains. But there is no doubt that East Jerusalemites are in our surveys, and and this is not new to us. Although the survey you have referred to is one that has been with a much larger sample than we normally sample in East Jerusalem. But there is uh, no doubt that each Jerusalemites share <clears throat> certain views uh, and attitudes about the conflict that are not shared by other Palestinians. Uh, what characterizes the perception of, of each Jerusalemites toward the, the conflict is a variety of perceptions and interests that have, during the past decade, led to greater detachment from the Palestinian body politic, the failed peace process, the failed second intifada, the building of the separation barrier, 
and and this particular one, this um, this barrier, which when completed shifted the socioeconomic the the focus of the socioeconomic life of East Jerusalemites westward, when before that it was eastward. Uh, so add to what I've just said, the disgust with the PA governance and the feeling of abandonment. All these have contributed to the current situation in which East Jerusalemites feel totally abandoned by the PA and by the Palestinians in general, that nobody cares, uh, again, their perception about their, uh, about their destiny and future. And this has led uh, to the situation in which they, like the other Palestinians, think there is no solution, uh, that the two-state solution is dead, and, and they have to decide. They can't continue to live in limbo. And so their socioeconomic life is changing, as I said earlier, with, with, the, with West Jerusalem and the rest of Israel becoming uh, the center of their life rather than the West Bank. And that has led to these very interesting changes in our findings uh, comparing uh, the, the 2010 and the 22 uh, results um, that, that do show indeed that there is a, a significant detachment uh, from the Palestinian body politic. Since I see that there is there is a, a great deal of um, interest in the in the idea of support for two state solution, I want to ask you one more question about it. I may be splitting hairs here, but I think it's uh, I think it's worthwhile trying to um, address this. When you when you are asked about uh, your support for two state solution as a Palestinian, um, it implies two things. One is support for statehood and for the national Palestinian national movement. The other implied is support for Israel to continue existing as as a you know a, a, an independent state. Yes, um, have you ever tried to separate? And this? and thirdly, yeah. you are also supporting a, a diplomatic uh, venue f for resolving the conflict. Right. So, have you ever tried to separate the two and to to try to gauge if there is, for example, any decline in support for um, um, nas Palestinian uh, national sovereignty uh, and and uh, statehood uh, as compared to the uh, decline in support for a two-state solution. See what I mean? Yes, uh, indeed, there is. A, uh, we do see a little bit of a decline in support for the idea of uh, of statehood, even when it is uh, no longer linked to a two-state solution negotiations and so on. The reason for that is that the behavior, the failure of the Palestinian Authority in governance in recent years has created a very negative uh, perception about statehood, um, particularly among the youth, who tend to be the most liberal and the most committed to clean government, democratic governance, and so on. Um, in focus groups that we hold at our center, when we ask the youth about this, about the decline in support for Palestinian statehood, again, separate from the two-state solution, the answer is usually who needs another corrupt and authoritarian Arab country. And so there is no doubt that the failure of, of governance on the part of the Palestinian Authority has done significant damage to the idea of Palestinian sovereignty and independence. The elite in power in the Palestinian Authority have failed their people in delivering good governance, but by doing so, they have also defeated uh, their own goal of creating an independent and sovereign Palestinian state. So we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to address, I'll, I'll try to address a couple of questions. Uh, people asked about the issue of succession. I think we won't go into it because it's very speculative, and I, I know that people don't. I'm sure that you would, you would not want to speculate too much. Uh, one question that I did want to address is uh, the Abraham Accords. What is the attitude toward them, and whether people see, whether you see, 
any potential in um, those accords for pushing forward the agenda of Israeli-Palestinian peace. So um, that's one question. Maybe I'll ask the other as well. Uh, and that is a question that I think people have, have asked a lot recently, and that is the issue of the Haram Sharif of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, specifically, what I'd like you to, to, to do is to help us explore the value of the site uh, for Palestinians, not only as Muslims, not only its religious value, but also its national value, its, its, its value as a national symbol. symbol. Uh, do, val do Palestinians view, view themselves as sort of guardians of Al-Aqsa, of the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the way that the, the Wahhabis in, in Saudi Arabia view themselves as the guardian of Mecca. So two questions here. One is the, uh, that, that both take us a little bit out of it. One is, has to do with the Abraham Accords and the other with, uh, with Al-Aqsa. The Abraham Accords, the perception of the Palestinians have not changed that uh, the, these agreements uh, do significant damage to the Palestinian cause, that they reduce the prospect for peace because they offer the Israelis, these agreements offer the Israelis the benefits of peace uh, without the Israelis uh, making peace. And it reduces, therefore, the incentives for the Israelis to make concessions in order to achieve peace. Why pay a price for something that you can have for free that is the prevailing perception, but there is, of course, an added emotional component to rejecting uh, uh, normalization, and that is the, the prevailing perception among the public that these Arab countries are uh, essentially abandoning the Palestinian cause, abandoning uh, Jerusalem and, and the holy places uh, in order to uh, address their own self-interest um, for most of the public, this interest is the interest in confronting Iran, for example, is not seen by the Palestinians as an existential threat to these countries that they would be willing to risk uh, abandoning the entire cause of, of, of statehood for an independence for Palestinians. So they underestimate the kind of uh, threats that these countries uh, confront and um, essentially focus on the negative consequences for the Palestinians. Now, it is, of course, one way for, the, uh, for these countries to address this Palestinian concern is to make the, the issue of Israeli-Palestinian peace central to normalization. If they bring back to the table, if they invite the Palestinian Authority to be part of the discussion and to have on the agenda um, the plans for reviving Israeli-Palestinian peace and negotiations and give the Arab countries uh, the, the ability to be partners in this process of resolving the conflict, rather than just restricting normalization to bilateral interest, security or economic add to it a, this component of peace, so that every time the, the, the normalization discussion uh, goes on, there is an Israeli-Palestinian Arab peace component to that. That, in my view, can help uh, uh, improve the, the prospect for future normalization, while at the same time uh, remind the Israelis of the need to resolve the conflict Reminding them is not going to be to do much to change the situation, but uh, to restore the Arab peace initiative uh, eventually uh, to, to what it is. That is, uh, normalization comes to the Israelis with a cost. They need to make peace in the occupation and so on. Um, on the issue of, um, yeah, but before I leave normalization, yeah. I would say the emotional component has eased somewhat because in in not the most recent survey, but in one of the, our recent surveys, we did ask about the support uh, that the United Arab Emirates gave to one of the hospitals in East Jerusalem. And surprisingly, we found a clear majority of the Palestinians uh, looking positively on that and viewing that as serving the Palestinian interests and so on. 
So this was a significant uh, development that dramatically changed the uh, reflected a change um, that we saw compared to previous answers from the Palestinian public about relations with the United Arab Emirates uh, and, and even tourists coming to Al-Aqsa from the United Arab Emirates, the responses uh, soon after normalization broke out was very, very negative and very grim. On the question of Al-Haram Sharif, uh, now for the Palestinians, of course, this is uh, the third holiest place in Islam. And um, they do uh, view in terms of international law that uh, this is occupied territories and that the Palestinians should have the right to self-determination in that particular area as well. And that the, in, the inclusion of, um, uh, or, or, the, or allowing Israeli Jews to come and pray in that area uh, could lead to religious war. And so there, there is significant concern about the new Israeli government and its attitude regarding these issues. Uh, what, what kind of religious rights Palestinians have or Israeli Jews have in the place. Um, for the Palestinians, the threat posed to this, uh, to the holy places today uh, is very different than in the past. And, and, and it could bring about uh, serious violence, almost mm, uh, any, viol any anything related to holy places will most likely lead to significant erosion in security conditions and instability in the West Bank. So um, now, because of the conflict and because of the concerns about uh, 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 who controls the holy places and, and can Jews pray there and so on, this leads to uh, significant unwillingness on the part of the Palestinians to recognize the Jewish links to the holy places. Uh, in, and, and in particular to, to that particular place. Um, this is something that wasn't in the past. Uh, if, if one looks at the literature uh, by Palestinians or Muslims and, and Arabs in general, before the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict started, we can see a very different narrative on the part uh, of the Arabs and Muslims regarding uh, the the Jewish links uh, to, to these holy places. Under current conditions, however, uh, one should not expect the Palestinian side to be, uh, I'm talking about the public level or even the PA level, uh, to be willing to publicly acknowledge these Jewish links to the holy places. Got it, thanks. Uh, before I, um, I, I ask uh, Jim Klutznik, our chair of the board, to say a few things for closing, just wanted to recognize the fact that uh, today is Laylat al-Qadr and uh, Thursday is um, is the, the first day of Eid al-Fitr. So I wanted to wish both you, Khalil, and all our Muslim friends uh, a happy holiday. Kul mm -hmm. khair. And um, Jim, the floor is yours. Okay. And, and I join in that, uh, in, in the, the uh, feelings about your holidays coming up now. Uh, I, I, uh, Khalid, it was... It was great when we saw you uh, in uh, on our tour, uh, and as always, you you uh, enlighten us in in everything. There's one thing, however, that I noticed that was missing in the discussion today, and that was really the discussion of uh, of international negotiations. Uh, we didn't talk about America. We didn't talk. We didn't talk about the history of Madrid and whatnot. And yet, in the meantime. Uh, both the uh, Israelis and Palestinians seem to make a real muddle of everything, as you pointed out today. And I would say today the Israeli government is in no better shape than the Palestinian Authority, and probably maybe even worse in some respects. And uh, to me, I think there maybe has to be a look back at Madrid. Maybe we need some real international, uh, I know it's in this world where 
you know, uh, Russia is uh, bombing Ukraine and China threatens Taiwan and, and, and the rest of the Pacific Basin. Uh, it it, it seems might be naive to talk about international peace negotiations, but I think America and uh, and countries like Jordan, uh, I, I pick those two particularly because I see a certain sense of stability there that you can you can uh, a locus of stability that you could maybe form something about. Maybe it's time to step back. And, and look at an international negotiation uh, that might uh, help people start to, to not just focus on the problems that everybody has, but what the prospects are if you have uh, the attention of the world on this. Uh, and I know the world seems to want to run off in different ways and, and try to ignore this situation, but it's still the central issue. Uh, the Arab Peace Initiative in 2002 uh, now comes back as the Abraham Accords. Well, maybe they have an interest now and in maybe in, a, in being part of a, of a larger framework uh, of international uh, uh, focus on this through a Madrid type of, of uh, operation. And this time, uh, Arafat, who couldn't come, Abbas could come or his representative could come. Uh, and so uh, I would hope you would think about that. And maybe when you're in the United States in the fall, I hope you're planning to come back to Boston. Uh, some of us would love to, to talk to you about that. Because I still look at you as being the guy who is sort of the linchpin on, on all of this. And maybe uh, I don't want to put the pressure on you in that regard or too much of a spotlight because spotlights <laughs> are not, not necessarily, sometimes they become searchlights. And we don't want that to happen to you, but we certainly would love to see in the United States and talk about that kind of thing. And I would value your thoughts about that. Thank you, James. Okay. I'd be delighted uh, to see you in Boston and uh, the near future in the fall, certainly. And I agree that we do need uh, a third party intervention. Israelis and Palestinians haven't really been able to put their act together. Although, of course, it is their responsibility, first and foremost, to do so. Uh, but uh, there is no doubt that an international forum and a U.S. role in, in bringing the parties back to the table is absolutely essential, uh, given the current constraints that um, on both sides. Uh, however, I, I, I would certainly insist that if Abbas goes to the Madrid forum that you have talked about, that it is Abbas who received a mandate from the Palestinian public first, and someone who has received uh, the legitimacy in, in elections, and not someone who has not yet uh, who has um, been avoiding holding elections. Thank right. you, Jim, and and thank you, Khalil, for being so generous with your time and attention. I want to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, the video and the audio on our on PeaceCast, our podcast. Uh, and this brings this webinar to an end. Thank you very much for joining. Thanks again, Khalil. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.